Welcome everybody to the Wednesday live show. This is our first Wednesday live after Self Reliance Festival. John, are you still alive? Did you make yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Are you, nothing. Are you nothing tired changed. At all? Nothing changed. Nothing. nothing. Nothing changed. Okay, we've got Mike the Polymath from Easy Peasy Gardens here. Um, Mike, anybody who hasn't met you or didn't see you over the weekend, let's like tell us who you are and why you would want to be on a live chat with John Willis and Nicole Sauce. Uh, okay. Um, like you said, Mike the Polymath, that's kind of what I've been going by. Um, I'm the host of the Easy Peasy podcast, and I founded a company called Easy Peasy Garden Solutions. Uh, and that is all about sort of, in a nutshell, selling vegetable gardens to normies. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I build basically really nice looking raised bed gardens, um, custom trellis work, and then I sell sort of a membership package where I come out and maintain that garden throughout the season, uh, try to make it as easy as I can for the client. Um, I like to say that if you, if you, you know, I have multiple tiers to my membership, but if you go with the standard or the premium package, all you should really have to worry about is watering and harvesting. I kind of take care of everything else. Um, so that's what I do for money. Um, the podcast is kind of my new creative endeavor I've been doing for about a year uh, where I try to interview interesting folks with interesting ideas or uh, cool ways of making a living. And, uh, you know, I talk about ecological principles and how they apply to sort of human culture, studied parks, recreation and human ecology in, in school. Uh, and so I, you know, I see sort of the patterns of nature playing out in human culture and in human society. And I try to sort of draw connections between what I, what I see and what I've come to understand about the natural world. Um, and why I wanted to go to self-reliance fest. I mean, I think it's almost, you know, self-explanatory it's, it's self-reliance. I want to be more and more self-reliant, um, you know, being a self-employed person goes a long way, but sort of that prepper permaculture mindset, um, you know, I think it's really important, especially now. And so I, you know, I couldn't resist. I, I knew a lot of the names that were going to be there speaking. And uh, Nicole, you were, I think, the only one that I had met previously. So it was a great way to kind of get get my name out there, kind of plug the show a little bit and, uh, you know, get to know some of the folks that have had an influence on me over the last couple of years. Yeah. So something that impressed me about you at the Self-Reliance Festival is you were not letting any opportunity go by. You were busy recording people the whole time, mm -hmm. watching everything you could watch. Like you put a lot of heart into your attendance there. And I think that's, you know, you're, you're a young guy, right? Mm -hmm. Relatively young. Yep. And you looked at life and were, and you thought, I'm not going to delay my life by going to college for a thousand years. I'm going to build what I want now. Mm -hmm. And you've done that first by starting a business. And there's a lesson to be had there that I think you, you can share with the world. So I'm excited that you have a podcast. By yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then I watched how you operated at Self-Reliance Festival and it was impressive. And that's that's part of why I thought, let's get him on a Wednesday live because we always have people asking us, how do I get started? How do I get started? So hmm. Mike, how do they get started? Well, you just start. I don't know. Um, so you, what you just said kind of brings to mind this concept of flow that I'm very interested in. And I think maybe we'll dive into it a little deeper later on. But uh, to answer the question you know, briefly, I, I try to stay in flow. And what that means is I'm kind of going and doing and um, interacting with whoever feels right in the moment. And to be honest, I, I used a lot of my sort of social battery up over the course of those two days, right? <laughs> like yeah. I spent the last two days kind of isolated, just napping and like, you know, did my laundry, put my life back together, sent some emails, but I can't do that for more than a couple of days. It was, um, you know, it was a lot, but I, like I told you before we got on live, I got like, five and a half, almost six hours of really stellar content. And I broke it up into two parts, sort of the personal one-on-one -on -one interviews and a couple of little group conversations. That was part one. And part two was sort of some choice clips from 
a handful of the lectures that that happened um but no it was a blast i you know i don't even care how tired i was i told nicole also john you'll get a kick out of this you know that 45 mile an hour speed trap about five minutes from your place uh heading east yes thank I, you. Yeah. I got nabbed uh you know got pulled over five minutes away from the festival and uh <laughs> Basically, I, I had no problem playing it cool because I'm like, nothing bad's going to happen. I've just had the best two days ever. Just stay relaxed, you know, stay respectful. I got a ticket, but no, no search and seizure. So I'm, I'm, I'm cool. And, uh, you know, basically just nothing could have rained on my parade after that event. It was, it was too Who awesome. Who stopped you? Can't say for certain. Um, I mean, do you know, was, was it Tennessee Highway Patrol or was it local? Was it sheriff? You know, there was one car of each, if I'm not mistaken. I think the guy, you know, another guy pulled in just as backup or whatever, but I think I was dealing with the highway patrol. I feel like they were road pirating our event. They like might have been. Really? told us they were there. I think they were specifically there to harass, you know, poach, to poach the working man. Well, yeah, I had a truck full of tools and they said, are you down here working? And I actually said, you know, no, I'm down here for, you know, an event, um, over at SOE. And, uh, they said, okay, okay. You know, that makes sense or whatever, but no big deal. I mean, I don't like it, but again, it's kind of like price of doing business in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I got so nailed I in North Carolina that way once. Mm -hmm. So I listened to your entire two and a half hour, um, uh, podcast. And my intention is to put the second one on today and listen to it. Sure. Um, you and I sat down and spoke and we just had a very different conversation. Like the energy is a little different than the normal conversations that I have. Hmm. And it, it's just stuck out to me, right? I actually went and found your podcast, subscribed to it. And I've been, you know, rolling through them and just kind of listening to them when I'm outside. That's kind of, I don't get a lot of service outside. So it's usually podcasts that I'll put on and listen to or audio book. And I've spent the last two days listening to uh, you. So, wow. well, I appreciate that. It, it's cool, man. You have a you have a really really good take, and kind of makes me look at things in a just a slightly different direction. And I, mm. I think it's useful, and I think that's valuable, especially to me. Awesome. Yep. Well, glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's the easy peasy podcast for the question in the comments. And that would be one word: easy peasy. Whoop! Oh, can you see that? Yeah, I got my MT Roman or uh, Patrick Roman neck knife, but easy peasy one word like peas, the pea pod, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like, I like puns. I'm a bad so punner. Your area of operation <laughs> for business is what fifty miles. You're, you're not going to come to another state or anything like that. You know, I would say it's almost closer to maybe 20, 30 miles. The cool okay. thing about Indianapolis is it's a small town. Um, I can get almost anywhere in 25, 30 minutes. I have one client that lives about an hour and a half south and they're almost not even a client. They're more just friends that I, you know, he's got Parkinson's disease and he just needs a little help on the weekends and his property is so gorgeous. You know, my dog can run free out there and living in the city. That's not an opportunity I get a lot. So I've got this one client that I charge half rate and uh, they pay cash and they give me eggs every week and uh, it's a good deal. So other than that, though, I keep it pretty small. You know, you got to be kind of within within the greater Indianapolis area. Yeah. Got it. Got it. What kind of dog? Oh, he's a he's a little uh, Shiba Inu Chihuahua mutt. Okay. That's my best guess. I, you know, he's he's a little guy, but he's got a big attitude. He he kills stuff whenever he can. You know, <laughs> I was telling I was telling a story at the at the bar like a week or two ago to some friends about how he found a little baby rabbit and killed it and and how I, you know, I, I wasn't upset with him, but he's just kind of like walking around with it all proud. And, and I'm like, Doc, bring it over, you know, give it to me. And I threw <laughs> I threw it to the chickens, right? And uh, this guy that was sitting like a couple stools down turns and looks at me and says, man, that's fucked up. I hope you don't mind, <laughs> hope you don't mind if I curse, right? Is that no, cool? Go ahead. Okay. He goes, that's a fucked up story. Why would you why would you let that happen? I'm like, dude, he's a dog. Like I didn't right. know it happened. It, it just <laughs> happened. Like, and, uh, he's like, well, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't let your dog do stuff like that. I'm like, 
bro, you don't know the first thing about anything. <laughs> you well, I'm gonna let your dog eat the rabbit, man. Yeah, well, I should have let him do it. He, you know, you got a point, but I almost don't want to like encourage it too much. Yeah. I love watching those channels where they bring the little dogs out and hunt the rats on the farms. Uh huh. And then they rack them up like a body count, and there's hundreds of these things, man. Yeah. That and minks, they use minks also to hunt with. Well, he hunts the mice in my workshop all the time, so. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got these. We, we keep all our feed in trash cans at each station where we're feeding the different mm -hmm. animals. And I move them every couple, you know, every five, 10 days, and there'll be nests of mice under there, and they scatter, and the chickens, man. The chickens grab these things and rip them in pieces. They can't eat a whole mouse, but they can eat them, you know, rip them apart. And oh, those, get the, those get the most comments. We're going to start doing mouse trap Monday. <laughs> we, just, we just have every different kind of mouse trap and see. There's a dude who has a mouse trap channel and oh, he's yeah? got millions of followers. It's people watch that stuff. That's cool. Well, you know, it's just it's it's funny because the story almost reminds me. Basically, it's weird. Like in the last month, I've had multiple encounters like this where people have kind of gotten shitty with me um, for no real reason. Uh, although I guess I'll say a couple of them is because I got shitty with them first. But like there's this tension in the cities right now. And for folks like y'all that live in the country, I don't know if you sense it, but like, nope. man, people are just ready to snap on each other. I'm like. I'm thinking I'm not going to stay out after 10, 30 or 11 anymore. Cause like people get a little bit drunk and then they want to fight you, man. Lately, like I've never been so close to being in a fight, but like three or four times in the last month, it just keeps coming. And I'm like, maybe it's time to get the hell out of here. You know? Well, you were in a bar. True. A little bit of liquid courage. Right. Right. He probably forgot he's not on the keyboard. Mm hmm. So it, it, and we do feel it when we go into like Amanda and I go into the city, like to Nashville, we go in there a couple times a month and, and we actually plan that out, right? We've got a little more gear. We've got a little more stuff. Mm. We're definitely looking around. We're not on the phones out, you know, walking to wherever we're going. We are physically both paying attention to our situational, surround. situational awareness, right? Yeah. And you do see more people panhandling and you do see people coming and it's just like, no, no, you can, no, thank you unsubscribe mm -hmm. no not interested mm -hmm. and they kind of peel off and turn the other way but you do see we do feel it we're aware of it we don't have it around here like i'm very compartmentalized i'll go an entire week and not even leave the property and then having having fences and gates is the best thing we've done so yeah. i mean we could go a month and not see a single person other than having to open for you know employees mail and ups well, you it's, know um, it's, if you if you Go look ahead, at your like your email complaints or your defensive emails that you get, John, for orders, look at their addresses because that's what I've noticed. I, I, yeah. it's it's fairly rare I get somebody who's like accusatory when there's a problem, but when it is, their address is in a city, and I just think that's what they're they're assuming the worst now instead of expecting the best. We we have seen an influx with that, Nicole. Um, just people being shitty to Amanda. Yeah. Or, hey, this is my fifth. And, it's, you know, it, it, there's, no, there's no inflection in text. Right. So the way they meant it, it doesn't matter what you meant. It only matters what I heard. And that mm -hmm. goes both ways, right? And I try to keep that cognizant of that. But when you, a dude's like, I've emailed you five times, I always look it up to see if I have five emails. You know, did I, did I fuck that up and miss five emails? But if we got a dude that's just, there's a history of, hey, when's this shipping? When's this shipping? When's this shipping? Hey man, I've, I've refunded your order. Well, and then it turns into, well, I didn't want my order refunded and they go insane with it. And if anything, we have gotten way better on customer service in the last year or two. Um, but we're just moving everything to a traditional business. Whereas you used to be able to order anything on the website wide open and we would build it whenever it happened. And now that we've locked the website down, there's, we deal with way more emails of, Hey, I, I wish your, your, we're still doing business in the old way, but we're just making everything easy for us. And in the last two years, we've really changed how we've done business with the thought that in case we can't, we've set life up so that if we could not ship anything, we're still good. Mm -hmm. well, it kind of reminds me, you know, a theme that I picked up from you, John, specifically was 
that the customer isn't always right. We talked about that a little bit. And um, as a business owner, like you have to stay respectful until maybe you're disrespected. Right. Uh, right. But just this morning, I got a I got an email from a lady who I'm talking about building a garden for, and you know I pitched this uh, you know this very simple design. Um, they just wanted something small, and you know on the site visit, I said really like this is the only space that works. This is the only place on the property with good, clear east, west, and southern exposure, and um, and it would fit really nicely here. It's close to the house. It's easily access from the kitchen. These are all the things that I tend to promote. You know, everybody in the suburbs, when I go out and visit, they say, oh, we were thinking about putting it like in the back, right? In the back corner of the yard. I'm guilty. Where I right. never go. Right? Yeah. I, where I never go. And and I don't go into the whole, well, zone one, blah, 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 blah. You know, I just say, you know, I've got this, I've got this concept. I call it the fuzzy slipper test. I said, if you can get to the garden in your fuzzy slippers, that's a good place, you know, without having to put real shoes on, you know, stepping stones the whole way out. You don't have to walk on mulch, grass, nothing. And uh, people, people just melt when I say stuff like that. Right. I don't think I came up with that. I almost think Jack might have said that at one point or something, um, but I've used it. And point being, this lady sends me an email this morning saying, hey, you know, it's always, oh my gosh. Okay. It's always the wife that I I'm dealing with and the husband who has other ideas and throws wrenches into my plans all the time, all the freaking time. And uh, so she, she sends me a message and says, Hey, you know, my, my husband wants to see what you think about putting it like against the, the fence line in the back of the yard. And, uh, and we want to like change, we want to shrink it. And I, and I said, well, first of all, like the box that I, that I pitched you is the smallest box I offer three by eight. You know, I don't do four foot raised beds. I do three foot raised beds with a trellis on the back uh, for climbers. I like and, that stuff to reach it. Yep, yeah. exactly. And so I said, this is the smallest box I offer. Anything smaller is just not worth doing. And if we put it against the fence line, it's just not going to get enough sun. Like, you know, I stand behind the, the placement that I suggested. Um, so I basically told her in, in as respectful of a way as possible, like either we go with it my way or we're not doing it. You know, I, I, I did say at the end, I said, my rule is I won't build a garden. I don't believe in. So uh, we'll see how that goes. You know, I might've lost, I might've lost the job, but I don't really care. You know, like I'm not going to build something that then they're going to, you know, give me a review that says, you know, this guy built us a garden and nothing's growing in it. You know, what a ripoff. We spent all this money and we didn't get jack squat. It's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Yes. Yeah, that five-star lift review, isn't it? It's, mm -hmm. it's like that. Speaking yeah. You know, of which, speaking of which I was going to tell you, John, I had somebody specifically tell me their favorite part of my, uh, self-reliance uh, episode. Part one was Ethan. Yeah, my, my favorite part is Ethan. I actually mm -hmm. went to Ethan. And I'm like, look, man, let's just be real here. Mm -hmm. You're wasting your time here. Let's figure out how to how to turn this into something. I don't want to see you leave. And I'm not I'm definitely not asking you to stop working because he, mm -hmm. I definitely need him to work. Yeah. Ethan works like no other dude that's done that job. Well, John, if you don't keep him, I'm going to poach him. Right. <laughs> that's and, a that, he needs, first. and he definitely <laughs> he needs to do a podcast like we had this conversation yesterday yeah. it's like i don't want i don't want to be public facing i'm like well then and and i'll i'm not going to give you i'm not going to i'll let him tell you his ideas he's got some great ideas mm -hmm. he just needs to do that right he needs to do that and i do not have somebody to replace him so we will keep paying him and continuing to bring him up and hopefully transition him into something else here um but he does need to do something with his ideas, you know, he was, he's yeah. just so well-spoken. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We've got a question here. Um, there's another question I have starred for later cause it's not on topic, but if we got time at the end, we'll hit that. Cause it's for you, John, about how things work at your company. So we'll totally circle back to that. Uh, but what happens when they no longer want the responsibility as in your customers, do, mm -hmm. do you take back the bed and all, or are they paying for the service more than anything? 
you know, I'll say that I have not had anybody say we're done with the garden. Um, I've had a handful of folks say we're, we don't need the membership anymore. And I actually kind of like that. Uh, I can only do so much as one guy. I can maintain somewhere between 20 and 30 gardens. Um, but if I lose a couple people, that means I've got a couple openings, right? And I like to say that I'm applying the whole proverb of you can give a fish or you can teach them how to fish, right? And so what I do with my membership is, you know, when I first started, I had this concept of like the gardening angels again, like I'm bad with puns, but the gardening angel would just come in and take care of things and you, you know, not even have to worry about it. But I kept finding that people actually wanted to talk, right? And so instead of coming, you know, during business hours where people are at, you know, gone at work, um, I shifted to where I would work a full day doing installations or what have you. And then I would go out from like 530 to 730 and meet with three, four of my members. And that way it's an opportunity. You know, it's it's a tricky thing because some people want to monopolize your time. And it's kind of like you got to get to a couple few people to keep this thing um, viable. And so you have to know how to manage the conversation and say, look, like if you have any more questions, feel free to like write them down, shoot them over in an email, but I, I really do got to go. Uh, but having that opportunity to provide consultation, you know, I'm, I'm like trimming up their, their stuff. I'm pulling weeds. I'm fertilizing the whole time I have questions and I'm spitting out answers. And, uh, so it's kind of like you got to be able to juggle a little bit to do what I do, but it's a really cool way to little by little teach these people who are totally overwhelmed at the idea of gardening. Um, you know, just give them little bits at a time. And after a year or two of being members and, you know, if they say, hey, I think we got this. It's like, you know, maybe they'll have me come help them plant in the spring, but then they take care of it from there. Um, you know, I'm I'm like rock, right on like. Do your thing. I'm proud of you. You know, <laughs> sounds like you're the therapist gardener. Yeah, that, I've said that exact thing. Yep. I yep. talk to personal trainers, and they're like, ninety percent of it, it, I'm a therapist, mm -hmm. and ten percent is physical movement and motion. Right. Try being a zipline guide. Okay. Uh, I, I want to bring a zipline. Wait, wait a minute. Have you been a zipline guide? <laughs> I have. Okay. And, Tell and the story. That is the worst fucking tour guiding job. Ever. <laughs> Man, I think we're the best clients when we go zip line. Well, you could do it and you'd probably attract the right type of people, right? But the problems, you know, in a nutshell, I'll try to be quick, but like you have to weigh everybody and <laughs> asking a woman to step on a scale and you're the one like, you know what that woman weighs. I don't care if they're 98 pounds, they don't want to do it, you know? It's like, and the, the occasion where you have to say, I'm sorry, like you're over the limit. Oof, that's awkward. And you got to get your face right up in their crotch, putting their putting their harnesses on because <laughs> liability, you can't trust them to do it right. right, so, right. You know, I always joke. It's like on paper. That sounds awesome. But you don't have any say in whose crotch that is. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then the, the, the worst part is you get them up on the platform, right? That first jump and. All of a sudden, they got to tell you about all their deep, dark fears. <laughs> you, know? right, right. you become Oops. you become the therapist in that moment, and you have to you have to talk them through their darkest, deepest emotional trauma right. <laughs> before they'll jump. Right. You know, <laughs> you can't just yes, you can. <laughs> you can, you can. Well, and you know what, John? Maybe it, maybe it suits your uh, your brand because yes. because you could just shut up, go. <laughs> so we have a we have a place called Adventure Works. And it's a nine course zip line. Takes about an hour to run through it, hour and twenty, depending on how many in the party. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And we found them at a like fall festival and they had set up a zip line. So we did it. And I'm like, hey, can I get you to come to our place? Right. And they're like, yes, we can. So we've kind of talked to these dudes a few times. We've taken 15, 20 people parties out to their thing. And they got upper uh, in the canopy confidence courses and stuff. Just super cool. Pretty neat. It is, it is good fun, you know, with repetition, uh, a lot of things that are fun can lose their luster, but sure. you, know, you, you get the right guide who really enjoys doing it and is good at it and makes a world of difference. 
I found a much more fun tour guiding job, um, basically running an ATV or side by side at a distillery, you know, giving people little samples of booze, telling them stupid jokes, giving them some history about moonshiners in the area. Like that is right up my alley. I get to, you know, you know, it's like that question you asked Nicole uh, early on in the, in the festival where it's like, are you an evangelist? And it's funny. I kept raising my hand if, if I applied and then I'd, like clam up and didn't know what to say right so you said like how do you evangelize well podcasting well yeah that's one of about 20 different ways that i evangelize right so the gardens are one thing the tour guiding is another like i kind of like to think that the nature of that tour in particular means i get to um subtly put libertarian ideals in people's heads right you know, talking about the moonshiners and just the way the liquor industry works and like the, the, like I said, the history of that area in particular, it's in Southern Indiana. It was a major hub. You know, John Dillinger was, was down there all the time. And it was a hub for moonshiners between like uh, Louisville, Cincinnati, Chicago, Indianapolis, uh, you know, you name it, crossroads of America. You know, at the intro of my podcast, I make a point to say coming to you from the easy be easy peasy workshop in Indianapolis, Indiana, the crossroads of America, right? Because I think that's significant in that I might have just lost the point, but I live I live basically at the intersection of 65, 69, 70, 40. I mean, right, like all right. these major intersection or uh, interstates come together right here. So there have been times I've been tempted to leave and like strike out in a new city just cause I, you know, Indianapolis, there's not a whole lot going on. It's kind of, we call it nap town, you know, Indianapolis, but it's because, you know, like not a whole lot to do. Uh, but there's something about Indy that I do feel is sort of significant for this world we're heading towards. I think it'll be a major trade hub um, in an agorist society. If that okay, makes sense. let's go into fantasy land. Uh huh. What does the world look like and why? What now or in the future? Or what you think we're going to and why you think that's going to be a major trade hub? Um, I guess it's hard to say. I have no, I have no crystal ball, right? But I think that we'll we'll see more and more supply chain troubles. You know, more and more. Um, difficulty getting things that people need where they need to go through the conventional methods. And um, you might see folks taking things into their own hands, you know, buying a 15 passenger van so they can go directly to the source, pick up, you know, yeah. whatever they're buying and drive yeah. it back them themselves because you can't trust it to get there. Otherwise kind of stuff. I, I like that, man. I'm seeing so many reports this morning of semi trucks just stopped on the freeways, stopped on overpasses, stuck multi days at fuel stations. And I like that because we want to have the conversation of the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and you totally just bypass that and went, we will handle delivery ourselves. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Even in the worst times of the United States, millionaires were made because they mm -hmm. took the opportunity rather than the fear. I, I love that. Well, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be the kind of thing where somebody's making runs from Indy to Nashville on a regular basis and the people in our community, you know, it's like, you know, the story of Lysander Spooner. Yeah. Well, because of you, I do. Oh, I yeah. Know, so you better tell us. So he was one of the great anarchists in early America. He directly challenged the American post office. He started the American Letter Mail Company. So at the time, from what I remember reading, you know, I... I pick up things. You got to like verify these, these numbers and all that. But from what I read, it cost two thirds as much to send a letter from, I want to say it was like Philadelphia to Boston in like 1800, right? It cost two thirds as much to send a letter as it did a barrel of flour. Okay. So the point was that it was a ripoff. They were overcharging postage. Okay like totally gouging the, the the citizens with this monopoly on postal carrying. So Lysander Spooner starts the American Letter Mail Company. You know, he starts locally, sort of just a couple of routes. You know, he only goes, you know, he would he would basically have letter carriers with a satchel 
carry, you know, they would get on, I believe trains were popping up. So they'd hop on the train from Philly to Boston, Boston to DC, and they would kind of deliver it themselves. Right. And he could even do local postage or local deliveries free, but he undercut the post office rates by a huge margin, huge margin still was profitable and sort of by doing so he forced the post office to bring their rates down to a reasonable level. And shortly thereafter, they shut his ass down, made it illegal. And, uh, that's, you know, so I say it's a, it's a tale of sort of victory and defeat. Um, but Lysander Spooner, he's somebody worth looking into. He, he wrote a few really good books. I, I haven't read them myself, but, um, he was a common topic of discussion at Childerberg. You know, those, those folks down there are pretty hardcore and uh, they all love the story of Lysander Spooner. They love the story of the killdozer, you know, all yeah. these, like all these characters that were just um, kind of out there in American history uh, for good or bad. But there's a, yeah. there's another world out there and people don't realize it existed. There's another way of life. And we are so, <laughs> embedded and stuck in the fear and you know I, i've been saying for the last two years what if it literally is here's some fear here's some fear here's some fear and it's just that cortisol mm -hmm. so it's the fight or flight so you're never fully rested and you can never clearly think right it's just like not touching this for the first hour of your day don't touch the phone everybody list don't touch the phone for 30 minutes and see how different your day is tomorrow than today mm -hmm. So this brings me to flow. I'm glad you talked about sort of stress, cortisol. Flow, I think, is one of the like most important concepts that a lot of people don't know the first thing about. Um, let's see how, how I do here. But imagine a graph in your head, right? You got the two planes. I guess I'll go this way <laughs> for y'all. But we've got our two planes, and we've got this diagonal bar that runs across. That's your flow, Okay. And when you're a baby, when you're born, you're a dot at the apex of the graph. Okay. Now this graph, the, the flow bar is where your brain wants to be. Okay. And above the bar, it says anxiety below the bar. It says, uh, boredom. Okay. And your axes are, you know, vertically it is challenge horizontally. It's skill. All right. Is that clear ish? Yes. I wish I had a visual aid here. I should have gotten prepared. But um, basically, if you're this dot at the apex of the graph and you're a baby, you're just kind of squiggling around. You might go into anxiety a little bit at times. You may go down into boredom occasionally. But, you know, you're, you don't really know enough yet to, to leave the flow state. OK, I believe all sort of animals, if they're not in fight or flight, or like depression, right? These are other words for anxiety and boredom. Um, we are in flow. If we're not experiencing these sort of what I would call like awkward states, I have this theory that if you're, if you're awkward, it's because you're not being natural. It's because you're not in flow. So again, if you're a dot, the day you're born, you're squiggling your way up this graph, you know, you're, you're mostly in flow. It's sort of like the more you learn and the more your environment um, sort of overwhelms you, the harder it is to stay in flow. And so you start seeing this, this smooth squiggle turn into this zigzag where you're bouncing between anxiety and boredom, anxiety and boredom. This is the American norm, right? We go to work, we're stressed, we come home, we watch TV, we're bored, but it's a, it's a way to compensate for the cortisol that we experienced at work all day you know you almost have to put yourself in a state of depression this is this is bipolar disorder right we are bouncing between mania and depression and if you again if you imagine so i think mental health can take all different shapes on this graph but if you sort of get stuck in anxiety and you spiral in anxiety that's what we call mania if you spiral in boredom you're depressed but if you stay in flow, you can keep wait, wor working your way up this graph, increasing your skills to meet the challenge at hand. That's that's where you're in flow is where your skills meet the challenge. OK. And if you're in flow more often than not, you have the potential to move much further 
up this graph and become a more skilled and effective person. Does that make sense? It, it yes. does. And, and it, could, it, it could even be just, I'm not going to have bad days, right? We don't have mm -hmm. bad days. We have bad moments. Right. So as soon as that's over, I find that if I'm thinking about it, I'm like, no, wipe that out, right? That, mm -hmm. that, that's in the past. We're never going to be there again. It's not coming back. Problem already solved. But I am programmed, and I don't know who programmed myself, I suppose, but I operate a lot on negativity, and I've really, in the last few years, tried to wipe that out, right? And uh, just being around super, super successful people, it's a pretty common theme that when you're around really successful dudes, you don't ever hear them talking about other people in a negative manner. They always want to bring people up, mm. not well on the negativity and just moving that aside it opens up so much headspace and when you have that you can you can i guess use that float scale and, and you know operate on a higher level yeah so people describe flow as that like in the zone right you're in the zone you're you're just killing it you're just getting it done right and um i believe the the behavioral psychologist that came up with the term and the theory um, he defined it sort of as, um, like I said, where skill meets challenge and where time becomes irrelevant and where decision and action are instantaneous, right? It's when, it's when the athlete is performing at his, his or her peak. It's when the artist is doing their thing, right? Wow. Um, when the writer is just like hours and hours clicking away on the keyboard, that's flow in the zone. Yeah. Yeah. I know John, you talked about that this morning. On, I think it was this morning that you recorded that thought about letting go of the negative, or maybe it was the other day. Um, I thought that was a, I was going to recommend people go listen to that. Cause you were talking about when something bad happens, it's an instant, but if you let it ruin your day, the rest of your day is bad. And that's one of the big, biggest mistakes. I see people, people who admire angry rants in their content creators, which is a pool of people who, some of whom are here right now listening to us. Who oh, think I've, it's I've done a handful of those. When we yeah. go off on a, on a rant and it uh -huh. is, but if you internalize that all the time in your own life, what happens, and I know this because I've, you know, days where I get on a live stream and the person I'm about to go says, how was your day? And I'm like, F today, blah, blah, blah. Like the rest of the day does not usually get better after I do that. Like the, two times ago that Tactical cut his finger and I had to leave him loose the goose in the middle of the show. I had just explained to them all the shit that had gone wrong. And I was like, I did this to myself. I put that negative energy out there and it's coming back at me. And now I got to go to the emergency room. So it's a very cool. important point, I think people underestimate how much they set themselves up to crash just by bitching about traffic or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think it's a useful tool as well though, because people can relate to it. Right. Right. Guys like guys like to come on my social media, especially and point out, well, you're a felon. You've been in federal prison, search warrant, CNN, blah, blah, blah. I harness that. They know that because I put that out there and told them, but my rebuttal to that is, then why am I doing so much better than you are? And why are you watching me? And mm. nobody sees or knows who you are. That's because I had that happen. And that's part of the story. And I tell that story to show, even with all that stuff has happened in the past, it doesn't matter. It, it's in the past, right? No, you're never going to watch a, a superhero movie or any kind of movie at all where the main character doesn't have some terrible shit happen. Nobody wants to watch a video or a movie where it's just all great. It just climbs, right? I follow up. Uh, there's a guy named Rob Bailey. He owns multiple companies. And people started sending me videos of his 10 years or so ago. And he goes, hey, I don't know if you know this guy, but you're making identical videos. You're saying almost the same thing on the same days. So we've mm -hmm. kind of become friends. And I've watched him grow in success. And as he has grown in much more success, he has wiped the negativity away and it's just not part of it. Would he be there without that? Would those eyeballs have been there? Mine definitely would not be. I would not have the audience I had had I not made the videos and that kind of content. So it, it, it takes, I think we can use it as a teaching tool though, or if nothing else, just an example, right? 
guys all through this weekend were like, hey, thank you so much. I know this changes your life, and I know you've put everything on hold. Not at all. I don't see that. I didn't see anything that I was doing this weekend as putting me out. Even at, at 6, 7, 8 o'clock, I'm walking around the property feeding animals. I'm moving some buckets, and dudes are like, man, you're still moving. This is just It's what I do. I, I want to do these things. And it's just if, if you want to do the things you're doing, it's not ever work. Like I don't work hardly any day. My work is done before I see another human being almost every morning. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I was going to say, I think this, <clears throat> excuse me, this kind of comes into what it means to be a polymath, if you ask me. I was about to ask you that. <laughs> <laughs> Sympatico. So when I went on Jack's show a couple years ago, we talked about what it means to be a polymath, and we kind of came to this shared conclusion. It may not be true of all polymaths, but then again, maybe it is, where we're almost um, in a certain light undisciplined in that we don't do stuff we don't want to do. And yes. when we get bored of something, we move on to something else. And it's not necessarily undisciplined, but it is sort of this um, way of being where you're willing to, to leave the job that's no longer serving you to find something where you can learn more. And um, it, can, it can take that. Basically, I think to do that, you have to be the type of person who really doesn't want to do what they don't want to do because you have to find ways around doing those things you know you can't just not do things you don't want to do sometimes you got to do shit to get you know get paid whatever it is pay the bills but if you're clever and if you constantly strive like i said to improve your skills to meet increasing challenge um you have no choice but to move on from 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 things that are boring right it's all about like if you get bored i can get up and do something man like I have this theory that, like I said, all I think all animals in the animal kingdom tend to be in flow if they're not in fight or flight, okay? Um, because if they get bored, they're going to get up and wander around and go find something to eat or something, you know? Like what kind of animal, you know, I clarify that maybe bears get a little bored when they hibernate, but that's different. That's rest, right? There's a difference between rest and boredom. You know, boredom is a choice. You can choose to not be bored. You can go. There's a million things you could go do to learn or, or just have fun or whatever, but you have to want to do it. I mean, I can sit and do nothing and not be bored because of the movie playing in my head. Sure. Me too. I'll think, I'll think about something I need to think about if, yeah. if I'm stuck somewhere and, and my entertainment box is not in my hand. Mm -hmm. That's why I've actually... I now schedule long swaths of time with my phone not in my life because I was finding myself every time there was a break looking at that instead of thinking about something. And when I think about things, I solve problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I made a video the other morning and that was kind of the topic of it. I, I spend more time. I start my day with what I'm not going to do and then do the things that I do want to do. And then as, as Nicole talking about doing without the phone, I think that I get so much done because I cannot sit still. Mm -hmm. And if I sit still, I fall asleep. If I get in a car, I fall asleep. If I sit on the couch five minutes, I'm asleep. Right. So I listen to things constantly and I use that as an excuse. It, it, I just go, right? I just go and get things done. So I constantly have something playing in my ear and I do get a lot more done if I'm listening to something than if it's just me in my own head. If it's me in my own head, I stop the task and find some other task because I've talked myself into doing something else. So, yep. yeah, yeah, that's what the conversation with John is like, too. <laughs> topic, 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 topic. Uh, I love it. I love it because because it, because he's in flow. That's when yeah, I spoke to you exactly and that, right. John, like you said, like our conversation was a little bit different. And I agree. I think. um I think a lot of the people at that event sort of at a gut level sort of understand flow and tend to live in flow. And it's what's guided them to this point. Like if we weren't all sort of skilled individuals, we would not have been at that event. Right. And um, putting words to it can help you understand how to sort of maximize it, I believe. But I've almost joked that like, 
is there any do you do you even need to know anything else about human psychology except flow like i'm not sure you do you know that might be an over you know overstatement but since i'm not a psychologist you know it's like take it or leave it you I know mean, ego but, can be real helpful what's understanding, that understanding how egos work can be really helpful sure yeah well sure but i guess um what i find impressive about certain people is that they are attuned right they're present they're they're responsive they hear you before they try to speak now some people are just waiting for their chance to talk other people actually converse and i think it's a it's an aspect like i said of flow and and i i find you know in talking to both of you that it's a very free flowing conversation right I would say that I'm guilty of that, waiting for my opportunity to talk. I would, hmm. I would say that. Well, I'm sure we all are to some extent. Do you, uh, it, go ahead. I was gonna say, it, it actually pops up very starkly when there are a lot of smart people around me hmm. and we're all, and it is, I think it's part of flow that we start waiting for our opportunity to talk because we're so excited and riffing off what other people are saying. You will start interrupting each other. That's a, that's mm -hmm. something that happened a lot at Self Reliance Festival. You when know, I, when, so many when people we, moving quickly. Sure, sure, sure. Well, an interruption is not always wrong. Okay, like, and you do try to hold on to thoughts if you're participating, especially in a group conversation, because it may be a really useful, valid thought. And you know, when I say like waiting on their chance to speak, I that's not exactly what I'm talking about. Some people want to crush your point with their point and they don't even hear your point right and um what i observed at self-reliance fest you know just for example you know it's on the on the part one episode where i was talking to nick ferguson and to be frank i kind of interrupted a conversation that was not really my conversation and um but i made a point in my head to remember hey this guy asked a question we're talking about johnson sue bioreactors i saw you go and back to it yeah. And it's not that hard to just, you know, out of politeness, right? Like I interrupted this guy, so I'm going to make a point to bring it back, right? Bring it back to his question because I don't want to hijack this conversation. But if you're not willing to sort of interrupt and ask for like clarifying questions and, um, you know, Hey, can you like go back for a second, explain what you meant by this? You know, that's not rude. That's, that's being an active listener, right? So I don't, really have conversations with people that I'm not interested in. Mm. So I'll spend a lot of day not having a lot of conversations during the day. And then I, when I do get into something I'm interested in, especially like if I'm doing a pod, like if we did 126 podcasts uh, called pulling the thread and it was uh, conspiracy theory stuff. Sure. And I would inter interrupt Jeff a lot because I would have a thought. And if I didn't immediately put it out, he's going to say something else completely interesting. And I'm going to spend five minutes in my own head trying to figure out what I was just about to say that I didn't get out. So yeah, yeah. I do, I do that frequently just to get that out. It's mm -hmm. just like when I have a thought, Nicole will get random messages through the day and be like, the fuck is he talking about? Because half of it's voice to text, my phone's wet. So it's doing all kinds of crazy <laughs> shit. I read that and pretty well. I don't literally, if I have some idea that I perceive to be good, if I don't release that idea out of my head in 15 seconds, I'm never going to act on it. It could be Christmas. It could be midnight. It could be two in the morning. But I'm going to, if I got an idea for a patch, a sticker, a shirt, people that do business with me, they're just used to. And my feeling is, well, I'm sorry I woke you up. If you didn't want to be woke up at two in the morning, you probably should have had your phone where you couldn't be woke up from. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> Somebody sure. in my family dies in the middle of the night. I'm not knowing it till no, the next either. morning. Yeah. It's going to be yeah. like, oh shit, got to go. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to know there's a tornado when I wake up out in the field. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I told mom that she's like, there's nothing you can do anyway at that point. So yeah. Yeah. Why worry? Yep. Yeah. So do you do any, you do anything with sauna and ice bath and stuff like that? <sighs> you, you know, I do occasional cold showers. Um, Cause I do find that that's highly beneficial. Uh, and sometimes I'll do a really freaking hot shower right before snapping it to cold. Um, Truthfully, though, my my arrangements here are relatively basic. So, uh, you know, I could I could probably get a big thing, a big tub to do ice baths and stuff. Uh, but that just seems like 
extra work when a cold shower does does the trick pretty well. Um, but no, it's a good question. I'm very like into the Wim Hof breathing method. Uh, it's a great way to get back into the flow if you're kind of spiraling in anxiety, which you know I tend to do sometimes. Uh, so knowing a few like breathing exercises, ways to hit that reset button. I think the cold plunges are a great way to do that too. Yeah. I find a uh, massage. I, the, the lady that was here doing massages come and I get a 90 minute massage twice a week as does nice. Amanda. And I find that when I don't, I, 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 first of all, it's the best sleep that I have when she's working on me. Mm. I will economy of sleep. I sleep about four, four and a half hours a night. Typically when yeah. she works on me, I get, I am much more restful about an hour afterwards than the entire, anything else left in my devices. And then I really notice it when she misses or doesn't come work on us. I really feel it. So I think the massage thing, I think people just, if you had access to a person, if you didn't have to travel and go, so like she comes mm -hmm. here, I perform at a higher level and she makes me a better person for sure. Um, when you get people around and there's, and there's people in my life like that too. And I, and I especially notice it when they're gone. And I, I find myself telling people like when they're like, hey, man, I miss you. I'm like, man, I miss you. You made me a better human being. Mm -hmm. It's funny how there are just certain people with whom you click. And yes. other yeah. people who you click with don't click with. It's just I had one of those explode at Self-Reliance Festival. Two people did not get along who I thought should meet each other. Really? It's okay. It, it is what it is. Um, I was like, you two need to never mind. You do not need to talk to each other. <laughs> like that energy did not match. My yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's 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 a fun question from from the audience. If you had if you each had five hundred dollars right now, how would you use it? I have a feeling I know what John would say because he said it at one point. What would I say? Turn it into five thousand. I was. That's exactly. <laughs> what I was going to say one thousand. Turn it into one thousand. Yeah, so sure. I came home from federal prison. Divorce papers, restraining order, 30 minutes in the halfway house. I came home thinking I had about $100,000 in the bank. I had 120000 accounts receivable every month. Mm. Come to find out I have nothing. I have to go find a job. I don't have documentation, not even a social security card. Wait, did they seize all your assets? Is that what I'm hearing? Or? No, ex-wife. Ex-wife. Oh, ouch. Unfortunate yeah, romantic decision. Um, power yeah. of attorney. But rather than fight that fight, I just shifted, right? So mm. I've always said you could drop me naked in New York Park with nothing, and by the end of the day, I'll have clothes and food. By the end of the week, I'll have transportation, and by the end mm. of the month, I'll have a place of my own to live. If yeah. I have to go and steal potted plants and hoses off of people's houses and sell them to other people, there's no situation, there is no scenario where I'm not going to come. Like So I came home with from success – even while I was in prison, my company's making money, came home and started literally with zero. And I had three jobs, 80 hours a week. The first week I was home having to walk into businesses and going, hey, I'm on federal probation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's not any, I don't understand, there's just no option. If you want to do, if you come and tell me you want to do something, we're going to figure out how to do it. But yeah. typically it's, I want to do this thing and then within the course of two minutes, they tell me all the reasons they can't. I can't help that person. Mm -hmm. What would your answer be? Talking to Nicole. Either one. How are you? Well, so I would say like, you know, when somebody asks a question like that, they're often they're like wanting to get an answer like, oh, go buy half a cow and put it in the freezer. Right. Something right. like that. You know, they're go, really go think. Yeah, go 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 buy something. Go buy a gun, you know, or whatever. Endorphin. No, like go buy some tools, man. Like you can make more money in a week with a with a wheelbarrow and a pitchfork and a rake. You know, just moving mulch. You don't even have to have a truck because you can call the mulch yard to deliver it to the driveway, right? All you got to do, you could have a little freaking sedan if you can squeeze a wheelbarrow into it. You know, I guess maybe a sedan would be tricky, but a you know, hatchback or whatever, or just if you're if in your neighborhood within walking distance, you know, go door to door and say, hey, like, can I trim your bushes? Right. A twenty dollar pair of freaking shears could turn into five hundred dollars in a couple of days. Right. A good day for me is between like four fifty and six hundred dollars in like profit. 
but that's before my overhead, right? That's before rent and utilities and all that. So, you know, any less is unacceptable, frankly. Uh, if I'm getting out of bed, I got to make, a, you know, a decent amount of money. But if you're just starting out, you know, when I started, I had a pickup truck. I had about five grand in the bank. That was it, you know, and I quit the job I was working because it was making me miserable. And I took that last big paycheck, right? That $5,000 I had, and I just jumped in with both feet uh, and, you know, bought the tools I needed and started making phone calls and telling people, hey, I'm, I'm going to be building vegetable gardens. But if you need any like landscaping work done, let me know. I'm just trying to get this ball rolling. And it was like I was busy immediately. You know, it's really not hard. 500 bucks, that'll get you a wheelbarrow, a rake, and a pitchfork. Nice plus, nice plus, you know, another Maybe garden you know. fork, too. Yeah, I mean, or just you know, that's it cost me about three fifty. Spend the two fifty on the tools, and then the other two fifty you keep to buy that first big pile of mulch, right? Like, that's what I would do with five hundred bucks. When people so, so, ask that, though, they're looking for the easy button, mm -hmm. and what you just told them is work hard. Right, right, yeah, so right. The nature of that question would indicate that somebody does not have five hundred dollars, mm. and I, I don't mean to sound braggy i have 500 dollars right now so sure. i wouldn't really do anything differently at that scale other than so if you're at a place where you don't have 500 dollars, the first thing you need to do is have five dollars and then ten dollars and figure out how to build up enough of a savings habit that you're not in a position where you're <laughs> asking a question about if you had 500 dollars, what would you do mm -hmm. You know, and and I think about like, why do I have five hundred dollars now when five years ago I did not have five hundred dollars? And the answer to that is I set a life strategic plan and goals and I started focusing on the things that were most important to me. I opted out of the programming of normal society and started living my life on my terms. Mm -hmm. And before then, I had always been entrepreneurial, but I had had. I had cut off my own legs by when there was success, spending it on shit, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's so I became more financially literate, better about reminding myself to stay focused, even though like you, I'm like this thing, that thing, this thing, that like that is a that is a part of my life and I tap into it. But if you don't have five hundred dollars, figure out how to get five hundred dollars, then figure out how to make that five hundred dollars work for you. If you do not have an emergency fund, Figure out how to get an emergency fund and do that. If you do not have a food savings account, work on that, but realize it's going to be one step at a time and staying focused really helps you. That said, if I had 500 extra dollars that I did not care about, I might be looking really carefully at Bitcoin today too. Yeah, it's low right now. Throw that one out there. It's but a little it's bit really low. Like, if all you have is $500, make it work for you in a way mm. that gets you more of what you want. So this makes me think of this, um, you know, this thought I had about sort of like your permaculture doesn't have to look the same as my permaculture, right? Mm -hmm. So to be perfectly honest, like I probably haven't had more than a couple thousand dollars of like money that I could just spend without worrying about it ever, right? And, and when I get to that point, I often take a road trip or something, do something not so financially responsible and uh, kind of end up back at square one. You know, I always keep the coffers for the business as, you know, I don't touch that. But my point being um, food storage, you know, bullets, band-aids and beans, all that stuff. Great. I'm not the best example when it comes to that stuff. You know, I. I keep some bacon and eggs and some beer in the fridge, but I'm kind of like this, um, man, I, you know, I eat a lot of meals out at the local bar and I love being around people. And I love sort of, um, I like to say that my stores are more like social capital than physical property. Uh, what I don't, you know, what I lack in food stored at home, I make up for in the fact that I have a D decentralized network of gardens all throughout the city that I can take a little bit from here and there as I'm doing my maintenance rounds. Like I don't need to ever buy vegetables in the, in the summer. You know, like I said, I don't cook a whole lot, but I, you know, I eat pretty well in the summer when those gardens start producing, I'm munching on a tomato while I'm doing my thing in the garden and you know, all that I'm kind of like foraging 
my clients' gardens as I work throughout the day. And if worst case scenario, right, if, if, if shit really does hit the fan, I've got 20 some people, like not even including friends and family, but 20 some clients that I could very easily say, hey, like new deal. I'm going to come out once a month and I want to have dinner with you, right? Then I got 20 dinners in a month that are taken care of. If I can make that part of the membership, it's like, and I think most of my clients would love that because we've become friends over the course of me working for them. And a lot of my clients ask me some really penetrating questions about things totally unrelated to gardening because they're kind of picking up what I'm all about, even though I don't broadcast it to them. Um, so again, like an opportunity for evangelism, but also that's almost like a fallback for me. If I needed to, I could, I could be fed by people who sort of need my services, you know, almost throughout the month. And that might be a bit of like a stretch, but like, that's my prep. That's my permaculture. And yeah, like I wish I had a freezer full of beef right now, but that's just, I, I don't at the moment. So, you know, what am I going to do about it? If, if, if the grocery stores run dry, you know, at least I have people, um, you know, we're all going to be in it together, so to speak. Yeah. I, was going, I was going to say that before you said all that, that's what I was thinking, right? You don't have band-aids, beans, and bullets, but you've touched enough people. You're like you're in enough, you've done enough good that mm -hmm. you would be accepted. A lot of the, I'm coming to your house kind of thing, right? No. If you came to me and said that, had that conversation, there's a real good possibility. I'd be like, yes, if some shit happens, you are welcome to come here. But the normal person saying that, they're telling you that because they went on vacation or they did whatever and they didn't take care of their shit. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that's different with you, man. I think that you are in a different position than most people are. Yeah, well, he would be a good partner to have. Yes. When I, you need help making sure food happens for the people in your community. Right. I almost no think it would, it would be a self-correcting problem because I've been helpful to others. They would be helpful back. Right. Yes. And I don't sweat it too much. I don't sweat the, the lack of preps in my personal living space because I just have faith in like the people that I've come to trust, you know, and um, that's something you can't really put, put a price on. Um, and I almost would think like, not to toot my own horn, but it's almost like I, I would hope that if things got a little bit dire, my demand would increase, right? My demand would increase. I'd have people saying, hey, can, can you please come out and help us next weekend? Like, you know, we really want you. And then you're almost like, oh, I can't help everybody, you know, but at least whatever I can, I can trade, I can barter, I can do value for value. I can, I can help somebody out and they'll give me what they can give me. Um, but again, it's like, I don't have a whole lot of Bitcoin yet, but I almost think that's just going to correct itself. Do you accept Bitcoin for payment? Not yet, but I'm about to get on the lightning do you, network. Do you know how? Vaguely. I vaguely. will show you how after this. Okay. If you cool. want. Because awesome. at, when you start taking Bitcoin, you start accumulating Bitcoin. It's right. very powerful. Right. Long term. Right. Especially, I mean, especially if people are paying you right now in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially because it's coming from so many places. There's not, they can track it, but not, not like you buying it from Coinbase or somewhere. Right. Have right. you thought about, have you thought about taking your business and building an online course and then selling, you know, teach that shit. I have and putting it out there, man. Guys, guys would I would pay to watch it. I'm not mm -hmm. even going to do it, but I would mm -hmm. I would subscribe to it just to see what it is you're doing. Yeah, no, I certainly it's crossed my mind. Um, you know, watching what you've done with social media, both of you, but you know, John, you're just like a freaking powerhouse on social media, and I was I was always hesitant to really put energy into it. Um, and finally, finally, like coming back from self-reliance after talking with you, I'm like, I'm going to sign up for TikTok. And I messed around for a while yesterday, made a few really cool little videos. And I'm like, okay, this is freaking easy. What have like, what have I been waiting for? Right. You know? And, um, I guess I'm not sure what my point is exactly, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do y'all mind if I smoke? Is that okay? No, we don't care. I, don't care. I figured you, you would. Have, once you have eyeballs, you just have to do things that people want to watch. Once you have eyeballs, mm -hmm. 
you have the ability to do a thousand things that you're not aware of. Like, I mean, even crowdfunding projects or selling an online program or anything. I mean, we spend, the average dude spends, you know, eight hours a day at work where he doesn't like being. He spends mm -hmm. eight hours sleeping typically. Where's that other eight hours go? And I like to say six. I'm going to work for six. I'm going to sleep for six. Where's my other 12 hours? What can I do? So you're probably not gardening and, and setting up beds and stuff at people's houses at midnight. But your program, if you've got an online course, people can watch that 24 hours a day mm -hmm. and the money's still coming in. So I'll tell you, like, if I can sort of briefly what my vision is for my company, um, because a big part of it is empowering and teaching others to do what I've kind of figured out how to do. Right. I have a very like easily replicated system. I've had lots of people say, oh, you should franchise this. Frankly, like, fuck that. I don't, <laughs> I don't want that. Sounds I don't like want to work. <laughs> no. And like, I don't like, I don't need to make money off the backs of a bunch of other people, you know, or like have to enforce it. Right. I want to, I want to empower others. Like I said, to do, do for themselves what I've done for me. And so I want to offer courses, sort of how to set up your own easy peasy garden solutions business. You know, hey, maybe I license the name and you can you can use the name, use the system, use my platform. I really want to develop sort of an online design portal yeah. and contractor uh, client connection portal and sort of like online farmer's market, if you will. So you know, social network and very like functional tool where you can design your raised bed garden, your berry patch, your backyard orchard, and then submit it for local contractors to bid on. Now, the only way this ever works is if there's people ready to build, right? With the skills they need. And it's not like, you know, I joke that really anybody with half a brain can do what I do. You know, I've done the hard part. I figured it out. But like the way I do these builds is really pretty basic you don't have to be an expert carpenter all you need is one of those little craig jigs you know the pocket hole jig i love it if you don't know about the craig jig if you're interested in working wood it basically turns any novice into an expert carpenter you know it's a it's a shortcut but i love it Shortcuts and um, are great. yeah and so selling a course doing in-person trainings um i would love to travel around the world or not maybe not the world but around the country and you know Next weekend, I'm doing a training in, in, in Cleveland. The weekend after that, Philadelphia. And like train up these contractors to then be ready to take on these clients. You know, And I think this, this audience, this community would be prime for like anybody that wants a side hustle. You can build one raised bed a weekend, make an extra five, six, seven hundred dollars, you know, like in a you day. You know what people want to buy right now? What's that? Security. That's exactly it. Yeah. Like you, the timing is per so when you put your course out, Mike. Shit. I guess Shit. I need to. I guess yeah. I need to. How fast well, can you get that done? Well, well push it. Yeah, I'll promote yeah. the crap out of it. Well, you know, and I appreciate that. Partly um I'm I'm realistic about what I'm capable of. Again, one man operation. Uh, but I'm capable of more than I've been doing. I know that. So why so not? Go find Go find a, a video editing guy, a video mm -hmm. camera guy. I know a want, couple that want some raised beds. Yep, <laughs> put his shit in there and have him film that stuff and start putting it together. Totally, totally. What do you do? What do you do about the chlorine in the water? What are your people watering their gardens with? You know, I I have yet to bring that up or have a whole lot of concern about it. Um, truthfully, Damn. I didn't I didn't really think much of it till Self Reliance Fest. Um, but most of them are watering with city water. Yeah, we are. We are yeah. here. Yeah. We just brought in, we have inline filters that will pull the chlorine out of the hose water. So we're going to start using that. Um, we watered last year, mostly not city water and the garden did seem to do better last year. Yeah. Um, and then Billy's Billy and William are very much on, Hey, let's get the chlorine out of there so much. So we're talking about putting 12,000 gallons of tanks out here. Mm -hmm. just to push garden water yeah nice. you know when it when it comes to my clients i try not to overwhelm them um yeah. so it's almost like i view it as a gateway drug truthfully if they get a handful of tomatoes and some salad greens and they kind of get hooked 
you know, then we can start talking rain catchment and uh, we can start talking about backyard orchards, you know, more, more clients than not sort of, they get that first raised bed and they have so much fun that the kids love being out in the garden doing stuff. They're like, what else can we do? And, uh, yep. and that's when we can kind of take it up a level, right? Um, some people are content just to have their little herb garden, but you know, I, I have a lot of, a lot of success, truthfully, just keeping it simple. Um, you know, I, I do a really compost heavy mix. It's not going to be the tractor chicken on or a chicken tractor on steroids level compost, but it, it works, you know, and the whole thing about don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. If, if stuff's growing, it's better than not. Um, but for those that are truly like transitioning towards full blown suburban homesteading, you know, rain catchment is something that I've done a bunch of times. And, and, uh, the whole idea, I tell them it's like rainwater is better for the plants, period. And end of story. How yeah. much water are they getting from the city anyway, in your climate versus from the sky? Does it we, rain a we lot get a, there? We get a good amount of rain. Um, so yeah, it, yeah. you know, a lot of times you don't even need to water unless it's been dry for the last handful of days, but yeah, it, it's good. And, uh, you know, Indiana, it's, you know, primo growing territory. Yeah. Yeah. Empty says we came back from SRF and had tomatoes and jalapenos popping out. I was gone six days to do this festival and my tomatoes, my wall of tomatoes that climb had grown two or three feet and put on suckers that were as big as they were. So it looks like I've never trimmed them. Yeah. It amazing. It was just like, boom. A jungle. Love Explosive it. Explosive growth has happened. Yeah. And don't you have. Practical, if you're listening to this, your dog needs to be removed from my home. <laughs> so don't you have it set up where your tom tomatoes shade your house? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, so that so. the AC bill is lower. Yeah, it's yeah. you know, love it. I love it. So 30 day review said he thought you were going to pull up a vape. I thought vape, but I actually thought weed when you said, "Hey, can I smoke?" <sighs> I have my I have my vices. I actually smoked all my weed, so I'm currently out of weed. <laughs> <laughs> I heard I heard What kind of easy peasy gardener are you? Uh, I know, I know. I don't run out often, but you know, when I do, I don't stress about it. So <laughs> <laughs> I heard somebody was. I heard somebody was skinny dipping in the pond out here. Uh, um, I can neither confirm nor deny. Is that you? We have giant snapping <laughs> turtles. <laughs> Are there? Well, nothing. Nothing latched on. So I guess I'm lucky. Yeah, that's a removal. Like we can't fix that. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad I didn't talk to you beforehand because it was fun. But awesome, awesome. <laughs> it was hot too, so I bet that pond oh, was perfect. Yeah, I needed it to be frank. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> no no incidents so good, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay i got another question here okay this one's from a while ago what do you find the hardest about gardening starting watering or maintaining starting so that's why i outsource it so yeah. i i used to work for a nursery uh, about an hour from where i live now and they make killer vegetable starts. Uh, they're one of the only certified organic nurseries around and they just do a great job. So it's one less thing for me to deal with, especially since I can just pass along that cost. Right. I, you know, and I can mark up the plants while I'm at it. So instead of going through the hassle of starting all my own seed, I just let them take care of it. I, I give them my order and then when it's ready, it's ready. You know, it, it makes my life a hell of a lot easier. Uh, even though I worked in that trade and I know how to start seed and I, I know how to manage greenhouses, sort of the limited nature of my setup here, I, I could build a greenhouse. I could do that myself, but for the cost of investment, um, you know, it's almost just not worth doing. It's a, it's a headache. And, uh, so that's my answer. Yeah. Starting. That's, that's the hardest thing. Have, do you always have kind of a starter pack? at the nursery that's already started or do you when you start talking to a client do you put your order in i kind of uh i have a you know i've been tracking it right so i've been doing this for four years so instead of needing to get like an order sheet and trying to match you know have you know two of this plant three of that plant you know for one particular client um and trying you know instead of trying to get the numbers exact i always order you know, I increase my order by about 10 to 20% over last year um, because I'm kind of growing at that rate. And I always end up with a little bit of leftovers. I've still got some plants. I actually thought about bringing them with me down to Tennessee. Yeah. I should have, uh, 
you know, I took him to Texas for Childerberg and yeah, I told some folks all the agorism and barter going on down there. I got, I got some, uh, some You're pretty trade. psychedelic stuff in, in trade for veggie plants. You know what I'm saying? But, um, basically right now I'm sitting on maybe $400 worth of leftover plants out of like $3,000 that I bought. So like I've made the money back on those plants and, uh, if I have to, you know, pitch a few, it's not the worst thing. I hate to waste anything, right? But um, just the nature of my business, I, 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 I'll cut my losses occasionally. You know, if I had a place to put all those leftover plants of my own, that would be awesome. Yeah, but you I'm need living to come live near the holler, right? I'm, I'm living on a slab of concrete in, in, in essence. And again, it's kind of like, why would I, why would I bother? planting and managing another garden when I've got all of these gardens that I can pick from at will. So yeah. release them into the wild. Mm -hmm. A little <laughs> gorilla gardening. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I do is I usually am able to sort of give, give away most of the extras to friends, family. And then there's a couple like small community gardens that I've gotten involved with. So, you know, in another couple weeks, if nobody else has signed up to get a new garden at that point, I'll probably just take everything that's left and throw them into the community gardens and uh, let them go from there. Awesome. So I want to talk about a concept that I call the Garden 30 because Tori just popped up with, we Mageddon has descended on her garden for a variety of life reasons, mm -hmm. which happens to many people. Yeah. The Garden 30 is you choose a time of day when you can make time that's about 30 minutes. And I, tr I choose a time when the sun is not on the garden because I don't like overheating. Mm -hmm. And I spend 30 minutes listening to whatever podcast or YouTube video I feel like. I'll be finishing Testimona's video this afternoon in my garden. And I weed for half an hour. Mm -hmm. And while I'm weeding, I usually harvest in that row or trellis or whatever. And if I do that five out of seven days, I catch up on weed mageddon because I too have weed mageddon having been gone for six days, right? Right. Do the garden 30. And don't worry about getting it all done in one one go. And it's amazing how how little time it takes to get out of that situation. Well, and I always I always tell my clients like if you can put your hands on the garden every day or like almost every day, it will just do better. Like period. Just by you looking at it, touching it, and being around it, you're gonna you're gonna be more attuned to it, and you're gonna you're gonna know how much it needs to be watered. You're gonna know sort of when things are ready. But if you walk away for five days and come back, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, there's so much and it can be <laughs> yeah. overwhelming. And so like with the garden 30, with the weeding, you know, some people weed with such ferocity, right? They want to get it done so quick and they do a poor, you know, a poor job of it because they're pulling things out and leaving the roots in the ground and like not doing it right. Um, yeah. And if you're not enjoying your time in the garden, what the hell's the point? You know, yeah, or a cocktail or an herbal tea yeah. or whatever it's your jam, yeah. smoke what you need to smoke and go, yeah, go do yeah. it. Yeah, but for you sure. Don't have, you don't have your clients don't have a lot of weeding to do in raised beds, right? No, but like, like I said, some of them that graduate up and start doing berry patches and other stuff, you know, a lot of times we'll start with the raised bed and then we'll do a couple in ground beds as well because you know, certain stuff, squash, zucchini, watermelons, like putting that in a raised bed, it's just going to take over and cover everything else up. Right. So, um, you know, some of my gardens are more of a hybrid, you know, a little bit of raised bed and a little bit in the ground. Um, yeah. Cool. And it's amazing if you don't totally reset your raised bed, how many random air seeds show up in your oh, raised that too. bed. That too. Volunteer tomatoes from the year before, you know, all kinds of stuff. There's, There's still one weed. I don't know what it is, but it comes. Yeah. On yeah. Your back. Oh, and it's so <laughs> funny. I get, I get so many like, photos from clients is this a weed like yep <laughs> nine out of ten times like if you think it's a weed it it's a weed like a squash? No? Okay, right weed. right right so we had we, we had hundreds in in probably 75 percent of my raised beds this year has shown up and when i do the the photo app thing on it it says that it's some kind of amaranth oh. and the only thing i can figure yep. is it's in the rabbit feed somehow and the rabbits are passing it through because it, I use rabbit manure in all of those beds this year, and that stuff has never shown up before. So it's got to be passing. Even though the animals are eating it, it's a ground pelletized food, it's still coming through there somehow. So you're going to let it grow and let it be fodder? No, I'm, pull, I'm pulling it. But I, made, I did – it's creating shade for the soil. I pulled mm -hmm. it, and where I did pull it, 
those beds are just sucking water. So we're going to mulch them with, I got chopped straw that we'll mark, we'll mulch them with. Well, it almost sounds like it could be a problem is the solution kind of thing. You know, if they're pooping out seeds of stuff that they're already eating, you know? Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. You know I what see. I mean? Like maybe just let it grow and let those seeds mature and then they'll munch away on those, Eat cut it, your yeah, feed okay. costs. Now John needs to further not cut his, his, uh, <laughs> his grass. Well, what is it near the pond? What is a weed? A weed is yeah. just a plant in a place that we don't want it, you know, but right, maybe we yeah. do want it there. We just don't realize it yet. No, no, really, gorilla is genuinely a weed. Okay. <laughs> okay. I really like mowing. Like, I like looking out and seeing everything at two inches. Mm -hmm. And it's been really hard the last couple months to let that because we're bringing sheep in and I need something for them to chew on and start developing grass. So, mm -hmm. kind of moving away from the, the golf course and coming into the pasture. Sure. So I have clay two to three inches down. Would it be better to use a raised bed or should I try to amend the soil? Well, <laughs> as, as with everything, it depends. Like what's your, <laughs> what's your budget? Cause raised beds aren't, aren't cheap. You know, like I only use cedar. I know Jack always says like, um, there's nothing to worry about with treated lumber, you know, and he, he might be right, but I tend to, take the more cautionary approach of you know cedar's better looking too and since since i sell to sort of upper middle class suburbanites they can afford cedar but if you look at the cost differential i don't know if it's really worth um it's like treated lumber ain't that cheap either so i like cedar but if you want to keep your costs as low as you can uh you know just do a single like two by six board you know put some uh weed barrier or some cardboard down you know six inches of really primo like soil mix, you can grow damn near anything um, as long as you water, right? It dries out a bit, but I'd recommend picking up uh, square foot gardening, Mel, Mel Bartholomew. It's a really quick read. Uh, I, I basically, when I read that book, it was like the light bulb went off. I said, I can do this. You know, like that's when I started this business was after reading his book. I'd had the idea already, but sort of the details of how to get it done, um, that helped out a lot. So that's square foot gardening, Mel Bartholomew. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would tell that guy also asking about um, raised beds, do the raised bed, a couple of them, and then mm -hmm. take a, take a four by eight or 10 by 20, whatever you want to use in the future and start working that soil right there just by putting sweet feet down or molasses or whatever. Yeah, that works great. Put what, as much manure and everything else as you can get in there and then tarp that sucker for six months. And what it'll right. do, it'll it'll create heat and moisture and all those seeds will sprout and they won't be there anymore. And when mm -hmm. you uncover that thing, it's going to be like potting soil. You're going to be able to put your up to your elbow in it. Yeah. Unless you're Nicole Sauce, in which case you will still get Perilla. Perilla? <laughs> Perilla, yeah. Yeah, so, I was gonna so say like double digging is another good technique yeah. for, for really compact clay heavy soil. Um, so like in the off season, like, you know, dig it up in like, I don't know, December, you know, just take a shovel, dig down as deep as you can, flip the soil, you know, just leave it all chunky, right? Cover it with a tarp, come back in another month or two, maybe like February and dig it again, right? Don't till it, just dig it, double dig it, cover it back up. And then in the spring, you know, maybe put down a layer of mulch and, and then you can plant into little pockets of compost instead of like covering the whole swath with compost, you know, open up the mulch, put maybe a couple big little handfuls or whatever into there of just pure compost, plant your starts right into it. And it'll do better than you think, even in clay heavy soil, as long as those roots can penetrate. And then every year just keep mulching, 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 mulching. And it'll, yeah. it'll improve rapidly. I, yeah. I let my garden be ignored for five years and did the tarp thing this year. And I still had persistent grasses and stuff when we pulled it open. Mm -hmm. So we just went with it. And I have, I had a nutritional imbalance three weeks ago. And just by going to each plant that looked sad and putting rabbit poop on it, most of that has been reversed. So just a mm -hmm. little handful of rabbit poop. So it's not that bad, but, um, Sometimes if you don't, you know, maintain stuff, guys, you got to go do it all over. So yeah, remember that I was, I was roasting coffee and said, how deep do you want your soil uh, in a raised bed or normally? I say as deep as, you can, bed. as deep as you can get it. <laughs> no, I say maximum 22 inches anymore. You're just 
getting crazy. So I use two by sixes. So I tend to build beds that are either 11 inches, which would be two boards high, uh, 16, and a half, 16 and a half, which would be three boards high or 22. That's four boards high. And that brings it up kind of halfway between like knee and waist height. Um, you know, some people get crazy and build them three feet freaking tall. And then by the time your tomatoes grow, they're like nine feet tall and it's like settled down, you know, <laughs> I got to use a ladder got, for my tomatoes. <laughs> I've got a bunch of troughs that are 24 and I fill mm -hmm. them with a course of firewood on the bottom yep. and then all the cardboard, we just fill them up with halfway with cardboard. And then, you know, that, that stuff will settle over the year. And then next year we'll add a little top dress it with a little bit more soil. Yeah. You're you almost, the, almost ahead. doing Hugel culture at that point. Kind, kind, people want to say it is, but it's, it's really not. I it's mean, it's small. Yeah. We've, but. we've pulled wood out years later and it's not broken down at all. Wood so it's just gardening. It's, it's filler. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong. If you want a taller bed, but you don't want to spend a million dollars on compost. Yeah. Run around the yard and pick up all your twigs and, you know, throw them in yeah. the bottom. For sure. You can even put chunks of concrete. You can put, sure. I mean, you can, it's just filler, anything. Yep. All those trees that we put inside the fence line, that's just wood mulch. We just busted it out and planted that tree in there. And hopefully it chases, you know, the roots down. But we've gone through and moved a bunch out, like you were saying, and put soil in there. And we've got pumpkins growing all out of those things. There's pumpkin yeah. lines all through there. That's awesome. Yeah. I see. I like the wood solution because it will hold, hold some moisture for you, too, mm -hmm. which is good. Yeah. Concrete does not. We were putting yeah. together when you're when you're putting together a hundred beds, you just kind of use whatever we can get. Right, right. Yeah, that is what it is. It's gonna say oh. too. It's uh, you know, it's kind of like height. Height is is not as nice as you think. You know, if it's up off the ground even just a little bit, it makes a lot of difference. But there's diminishing returns. On, on the well, height. you do end up with the opposite problem. Like even my my tomatoes, I do end up on the ladder by the end of the year. Yeah. Well, and, and I was going to say they're the taller... only like fourteen inches starting off the ground of the system, fourteen to twenty four, I think. The taller the bed, the more you got to water it. So keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah, I like having mine waist height, mm -hmm. and then you know we, it's cabbages, and my tomatoes are in you know whiskey barrels. Sure. Cool. Cool. Um, but I like Swiss chard, cabbages, lettuce, all that stuff. I like having it waist height. Even our jalapenos, we put we put waist height in our okra, and the okra does it does get big. Mm -hmm. Hey, kitty! Visitor, yeah. Somebody was asleep and decided not to be asleep anymore. That happens all the time. That's LT. He's going to now do the circle thing where he just keeps coming back up because he's a cat. Anyway. All right. So talk, talk to us about making permaculture sexy again. <laughs> it's like my favorite topic. So, okay. I think, I think, uh, flow has a whole lot to do with it. Right. So the, the more you're in flow, the cooler you are <laughs> in a nutshell. Like I said about like, I think awkwardness is when we're just not in the flow, like when we're overthinking things or when we're just disengaged, right. That's a matter of, are you anxious or bored? Um, but if you're engaged, like you're cooler than you would be if you're not. And, um, you know, we, we talked about this briefly at the festival, Nicole, uh, about like, maybe don't use the P word. Right. So like, P word. as in, as in permaculture, right. Cause like it sounds kind of, sounds a little dweeby, but at the same time, like there's a time and a place, um, you know, it's like, I call myself Mike, the polymath, like that's kind of dweeby, but I'm trying to make it cool. Right. Like it sounds almost pretentious, but I hope I don't come across that way. It's what I'm trying to encourage other people to be as well. I'm not saying I'm the only polymath there is, right? Like just trying to get that concept into your head. And um, so when it comes to like, you know, I think about Billy and William Bond, right? Yeah. I mean, those dudes are so cool. They are so cool. They're so cool. They talk about being like the pimp daddies of permaculture, you know? And like, it, I mean, or, uh, Billy, yeah, he could easily have been a stand-up comedian. You know, that dude's got more one-liners than anybody. And, he was a radio um, host guy. Was yeah. he? Okay, that yeah. makes perfect sense. Perfect yeah. sense. And um, so there you go. Like, effective communicators should be at the front, you know, forefront of this movement. And we should be conscious of, like, just being cool, man. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, if we're wagging our fingers at people, if we're 
you know, if we're talking at this like ethereal level that nobody understands, it's going to turn them off, right? Like I, I, I hope that we don't have to give up on all the normies. You know, I've seen people come over from that that like normie side to to kind of getting it at least a little bit at a time. So I, I don't ever want to like just say, you know, screw everybody. Like, let's just focus on the remnant. Like we're, we are who we are. There's no hope for the rest of them. No, like there's hope for some, uh, hence the need for evangelists. But like, we got to be cool about it. You know, I grew up in like the non-denominational Christian church, like mega church, right? Evangelical Protestant. And it turns a lot of people off because... I hate to say it, but they're like trying too hard to be cool a lot of times, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, you know, I joke that it was like the rock and roll for Jesus kind of church where, you know, fog yeah. machines, laser shows, all this stuff. And it didn't feel authentic to me. Um, you know, I think that like Orthodox Christianity is cooler than, than non-denominational like rock and roll for Jesus. That's just my opinion because there's an authenticity to it and a, and a in a sense, like a seriousness, but um, I don't know. Like if you don't take yourself seriously, no one else will, but you cannot take yourself too damn seriously at the same time. I don't know if that is a good answer, but that's, yeah, that's kind of what know, I, I think, think about. So having been in the libertarian policy wonk world, there's a lot of nerd there mm -hmm. and freedom is not cool. Liberty is not cool. I think it's cool, but I think it's cool. Do not think it's cool. <laughs> And yeah. then I was at the Libertarian National Convention mm -hmm. and across the aisle for me is this cat with like hipster sideburns and glasses and dark hair, Free State Project. Yeah. Everybody at their booth was young and hip. And I was like, he's trying to make freedom hip is what yeah. he's working on right now. And it worked for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, freedom is actually more cool now than it was way back when I first came across the Free State Project. You know, the P word is confusing, but if you, if you learn the system's thinking it's not just about growing food it's about growing your business it's mm -hmm. about making your life better it's about addressing relationships that are influencing your life like it, it can apply to everything and there is a system for it but we don't have to always focus on what the system is it's kind of like when somebody designs a phone app you know the engineer who designs the phone app should a hundred percent of the time never be the one you bring up on stage to explain why we need the phone app and what totally. it does. Because totally. he will tell you all the things that were important to him and all the things he considered while designing the stupid phone app. And you have no idea what the friggin' thing does. Right. You know, that's it's like choose choose your evangelist, right? Let's be evangelist about permaculture. It is cool and it's very freeing to be able to step back and say, but what's my goal? Where do I want to go? Okay, now I can make that decision about those five hundred dollars that I just had and was going to throw it, you know, 5 billion pounds of beans. So I don't starve next year, which would probably be a terrible decision. You know, I think, I think that segues to the whole be prepared, not scared. Right. Yeah. You can't be cool. I'm wearing, I'm wearing the wrong shirt. Cause it's in the laundry. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> All of my, yeah, I get you. But um, no. So like if you're freaking out and paranoid, who's going to want to hang out with you? Like nobody. Right. So you got to, you, you got to chill out a little bit. <laughs> I think it just comes down to do good shit, right? Do good mm -hmm. shit, do real shit. Mm -hmm. And then every day build on it so that it's bigger and bigger. And then it's like fishing. We just throw that hook out there. It doesn't even have to be baited. I used to drive in San Diego. When I was in San Diego, I would see billboards that said, uh, who is Ron Paul or Rand Paul, Ron Paul. And it, Ron Paul. you would just see these stickers, Ron Paul, Ron Paul, Ron Paul, ronpaul.org or whatever. I never knew the word libertarian, had never heard it, listened to Spearco all the time. But prior to that, who is Ron Paul? Just like who is John Galt? Yeah. You just, we just put the, we put the little bait out. We sprinkle the bait and some of the birds eat it. And then they come and look where the better stuff is. Right. So I think it's just important to do it. If we do good stuff, the right people will show up. And when those people show up, they're going to evangelize there. Everybody brings one person. All we need is everybody to bring one person. That's all I need. Yeah. And bring him to something like Self-Reliance Festival or other events like that. Yeah. It's not a bad entrance into it because what we're doing there is showing you the non-hysterical side of building the life you want to live. Right. right? There was, 
everybody at the thing has guns and, and all the stuff, right? They're all tactical dudes. Well, half of them. But mm-hmm. you didn't see gun vendors here. You saw no. you, you saw positive con- – and not that guns are a problem. At, not at all. That's my but it was, it's not a gun and knife show. No. Right. Right. Well, it makes me think – so, okay, you said who is John Galt, right? Anybody that doesn't know that reference, we're not going to be able to explain yeah. it too easily. But I was on my way to Childerberg down in Texas, and I stopped – at Bucky's, right? Y- y'all know about Bucky's, We're I'm sure. Right now. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Um, and I go into the. Actually, it must not have been Bucky's because they don't allow. You, you don't see a lot of toilet stall graffiti. But I, I stopped at some truck stop. I think it might have been Arkansas or Missouri or something. But I saw on the toilet paper dispenser somebody wrote, "Who is John Galt?" And I'm like, "Oh, how interesting!" You know. Yeah. I haven't ever seen that before. Not You've in been the... on my toilet roll dispenser before. <laughs> but I'm like, you know, it almost seemed like serendipitous. Of all the stalls, of all the truck stops, I sit down here on my way to Childerberg and I see who is John Galt. And it almost right. gave me chills, right? And um, speaking of just making this stuff cool, now Childerberg is not a very permaculture-focused event. It's strictly like anarcho-libertarian, you know, agorist kind of, let's all just get together, have fun, hang out, barter, um, you know, take whatever drugs you, 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 you so choose as long as you hold your shit together kind of thing. You know, there's a little music, a little comedy, but it was not the hands-on practical stuff that Self-Reliance Fest was. But what it was, was super cool. <laughs> you know, it was like everybody, you know, the, the level of conversation you can get to when we're not arguing about all the other like little bullshit um, is, is pretty astonishing. And I think about what, uh, again, what Billy Bond said where he quoted the Bible and I won't get it quite right, but he talks about how like, or no, it wasn't the Bible. It was the first continental Congress that, that quote about, you know, how any gathering of, of imperfect souls could never rise to the level of perfection. So, you know, how astonishing is it that we've come so close, right? So close to a perfect congregation. Um, I mean, what's cooler than that? Like, I want to be at every one of these events. Probably can't afford to, but I'm going to work towards that. Yeah, well, you know, start bringing some money in with the podcast and that'll be a a self- what can you do by October to pay your nut to go to October? That's the question you, know, you should be asking, right? I'm thinking about a tenfold increase in listenership. That's what I'm going for. <laughs> Maybe a hundredfold. We'll see. So what do you what do you think that you're going to speak on in October since you're definitely going to be here, Mike? I'm thinking this this concept of make per, making permaculture cool awesome. and sort of the backbone of that argument being flow theory. Like I just think everybody should have a really strong grasp. If I had a whiteboard, I would I would make flow clearer to you than you ever thought possible. If only there was a whiteboard on the stage. I know, huh? Whoever would have thunk about doing something like that? Pretty yeah, sure. So Will, William's on his way back here Monday. They'll be here <laughs> doing a doing a whole um, site survey for an installation we're going to do in two months here. Okay. So we're going to do Maybe swale faster than two months. <laughs> Whales, food forest, the whole deal. But he's he's back here on site Monday. They'll be back down. Cool, cool. So, when, so awesome. you said you're doing that installation in a couple months. Yes. Well, hopefully if, towards the end of July. If you need some extra hands, uh, I might be available. Awesome, man. Yeah. yeah, I I've yet to do any like large scale swale implementations, so I would be super interested in being a part of that. We've got some small ones, but to but to see them put in and installed and have people standing here to mm-hmm. see it and then see you know how we're going to, how it's going to be planted and, and what's going to actually happen. I mean, everybody knows swales, and the first thing they want to do is put in swales. But it's like Jack says, you know, everybody doesn't need swales. And then watching it on on YouTube or reading about it, it's very different than when you see them actually when you're standing there. Well, and it's kind of like compost. Uh- Everybody wants to do it. Not everybody yeah. does it. Not everybody does it right, or even needs to do it in the first place. And my right. swales do the opposite of what John's swales need to do. Mine get the water away from things. Mm. Yeah, I, I do compost with a skid steer. We yeah, scoop it up and throw scoop it. Scoop it, flip it, yep. walk away. Yep, that's cool. Yeah. Okay, John, you ready for your question? Sure. It's all about t-shirts. 
So we put one shirt out every Monday. Typically, we're going to drop a new shirt. We do 120 pieces, and they typically sell out in 30 minutes. So if you think you want one of these shirts that we put out, whatever that is, um, you need to be probably on my – you need to watch my live feeds at 9 o'clock. That's where we show them at first, and they typically sell out then. And then on Tuesday, Amanda will send out on our text app, and you can get on our text and email list off of our website, soetacticalgear.com, and everything sells out. Everything we sell is typically sold out in 30 minutes. So we're not the easiest people to do business with, but I live in the middle of nowhere, and I need 20 more employees. So we do it's, – it's, if I can sell 100 of something, we're only building 75, and we do that on purpose. It builds urgency. The clients that do business with us, they have, well, I don't have time to do I understand. I get it. But unfortunately, there are 1,000 people who do have time, and it is important enough to them. They set a reminder or an alarm or whatever it is. But 30, we do 120 shirts, and we very rarely rerun them. Now, the question is, well, then why would you have all those shirts on the site? Because I want you to see all the cool shit we do, mm-hmm. and I want to go pay attention. And that's, that's why we do it. Well, and that's what we call scarcity marketing, right? Like yeah, so I, I, I apply something similar with this members only, you know, I, I don't want more than 30 clients. If I end up with the, you know, number 31, I'm going to have to tell them, sorry, there's no more room, you know, maybe next year, like, yeah, I'll add yeah. you to my wait list or what have you. Um, that, that's Supreme's whole marketing program, right? They drop mm. a $3 shirt for 75. People literally kill each other standing in line for it. And then the guys that get them take and flip them for a thousand dollars that night on eBay. Yeah. So that I kind of just figured how can we utilize that? And that's kind of that's kind of what we do. And I'm really moving to a point in the next year or so, two years, I won't have a front facing website. You will you will be existing customers. To be new clients, you're going to have to be referred because we're changing how we do everything. The last two years has been spent so that we don't have to do this anymore. So I'm going to plug a friend uh, who you know, Nicole, Jared, the permi guy from Revolution Solution. He was at Childerberg with me. He was the reason I went. You know, he, he mm-hmm. invited me and um, he has this side hustle called Limited Supply Designs. Okay. Yeah. He goes to Goodwill. He buys plain like T-shirts of all different colors and sizes and then he puts, you know, he has his own like screen printing setup and he puts his own designs, you know, all very libertarian minded stuff, a lot of Bitcoin stuff, what have you. But what that basically does is he's got completely one of a kind T-shirts. Each T-shirt is unique. And, you know, I've got one that's like a lime green. I was wearing it at, 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 uh, at Self-Reliance Fest and all it says is end the fucking wars but it was like the lime green and the tank top. And I'm just like, this is my shirt. And then my Lysander Spooner shirt, he made that too. And so like totally capitalizing on this, like upcycled only, like each shirt is unique. You will never see two shirts of the same design, same color, same size. Like you get what you get. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of neat that way. I, I figured I'd throw that out there Add him on Instagram, limited supply designs. And cool. I think he's got an Etsy store, if I'm not mistaken. And the way and the way you sell him and, and promote him is by telling that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's pretty right, resourceful. Let's, yeah. Let's go once around the horn. What do you want? What do you want to say before you sign off, Mike? Listen to Easy Peasy. You know, if you want to help out and support, that would be awesome. I got a donation button on my website. I'm going to work on uh, setting up accepting crypto. I'm not quite there yet, but you can make a PayPal donation if you want to keep this show going. Um, you know, I'd really appreciate that. So what's your other social medias? Uh, I just signed up, like I said, to TikTok. Um, so I believe I'm easy peasy podcast on TikTok. I am Mike underscore the underscore polymath on Instagram and easy peasy gardens on Instagram. If you want to see my professional stuff, um, and I've got a YouTube channel, but not a lot's going on there yet. So what, what's the uh, website for your podcast? Easy peasy gardens.com. All right. Yep. Cool. John, what do you got? I do a live feed every night at nine o'clock on YouTube. Um, it's super hard to find 
Like you'll go look for it while I'm broadcasting and you won't be able to find it. So get on our text app. We're starting to send those links out. We're super, super shadow banned. Um, but if you want to have these conversations, I have this conversation every night at nine o'clock, literally almost every day of the year. So join in. And if you want to buy product, that's typically where you'll see what we made each day. So you can kind of get, you can, you can game it and get there before we've actually shown it. So it usually, that's where that happens at. Guys, I roast a badass cup of coffee over at hellarose.com. And if you want to follow my podcast, where I talk about building the life you choose on your terms, that's the Living Free in Tennessee podcast at livingfreeintennessee.com. But what's more important to me today is to thank everybody who came out to Self-Reliance Festival and shared your stories, your tears, your unexpected volunteer help. Uh, the number of people, we had so many people asking to help us there. We couldn't give you all something to do, but we really appreciate the energy that has come from that event and the stories we're hearing. I was really excited to see Grumpy Acres Farm is starting a business and going to announce that as a result of being at Self-Reliance Festival. For those of you who've been emailing me saying, what about the next one? What about the next one? What about the next one, Nicole? I've answered you saying it's October 1st and 2nd, so you can <laughs> save the date. However, if you want to buy tickets, those drop on Friday. And the other thing that's really important that drops on Friday, if you wonder how one becomes a speaker there, there is a speaker application form, a demo application form, a vendor application form, and tickets. All of that is dropping on Friday. So if you want to throw your feather into the uh, into the bucket there for, for giving us an interesting talk, that's the best way to do it. That's at selfreliancefestival.com. I'm really excited. I think, I think we're going to 10x... I think October is going to be huge. There's going to be a balloon with a zip line, apparently. I'm talking to John today. Well, don't ask me to be your guide. <laughs> so if, if you think, if you even think that you have something that you want to present at this next October event, get on that sooner than later. Like we, we had 500 some people here. We, we can only house 1,000, which will probably blast right past that on this next one. And yep. we only have so many slots. So if, if your stuff's not awesome and you think you want to be there, get in early because there's a lot of awesome, right? And you're never going to be awesome until you start doing it. So do that sooner than later. I'll say I, I met Grumpy Acres, Grumpy G, um, really good dude. And uh, I'm glad he's tuned in. So what's up, Grumpy G? Hope yeah, the Grumpy business goes well. Grumpy and I'll himself. say, I'll say, since you all thanked all the, all the people that came, uh, I got to thank the two of you on behalf of the rest of us for putting in all that work, you know, because it, it all put in all the work. I did not. Well, Nicole's I, team put in all the work. Yeah, and, yeah. and I and I need to remember that too because Nicole has people behind her, but Nicole's the lead singer of the band. That's the I'm the lead singer of the band, but man, they do a lot of work. Hey, thanks, thanks for that uh, super chat, guys. Razor, appreciate that. Always helps out. All right, so we'll see you next. Wednesday with Billy Bond, guys. If you want to never miss one of these these lives, and if you want to maybe sometimes get informed when John goes live, but not usually because YouTube hates him, hit the like and the bell. On when you click on the bell, it lets you choose what you're notified about. If you're notified about everything, it'll bring it back up. And what I have found is when I stop getting SOE notifications, if I go back to the bell, they come back up for a while. So, so what happens is that gets turned off, right? And um, anyway. Cheeky last bastards. Last, Cheeky last bastards. comment too. Razor said authenticity versus uh, cool. Just try to do both. Same difference, man. Let it, yeah. let it, let it be the same thing. Yeah. Imagine you, you have to have one of two things: money or knowledge. Imagine what happens when you have both. Yeah. It's fantastic. Awesome. All right. Thank we'll you see, guys. see, see you guys later. <laughs>